Good morning and welcome back to my channel. My name's Jackie, if you're new here, and I'm currently prepping my revision project for Camp NaNoWriMo. So I'm going to be working on Powerless, which is the thing I wrote in Nano 2019. So at this point, I've already looked at my characters. I've given the plot an overview and good news is the plot seems to be fairly solid. So I'm hoping that when I get feedback from someone else, they agree with me. Today what I want to look at is whether I can rework my scenes using the five commandments of the story grid. So from here, I'm on holiday at the moment, I'm going to find a nice little place to situate myself by the lake and then I will tell you what the five commandments are and what I'm going to try to do with them. a bit later than it was when I came out here yesterday. I think yesterday was about 7 a.m. and today it's 9.30 and it's already quite hot so I don't know how long I'm gonna last but we'll see. Anyway this video was inspired by Nicole Wilbur who's another author tuber who did a video on how she reworked one of the scenes from a high school story that she wrote using the story grid's five commandments. Now these five commandments are basically points that Sean Coyne, the author, says every beat in your story needs to hit, every scene in your story needs to hit, every sequence of scenes in your story needs to hit, every act, so if you have a three-act structure, every act needs to have these elements, every subplot needs to have these elements, and the global story needs these elements as well. Now, thinking about like that level of inception makes me feel like my brain's going to explode, so I'm not going to do that. I'm very happy using story engineering for my global story structure. However, seeing Nicole's video, especially seeing the attachment she included in her description, which has the original scene as well as the new one she reworked, made me realize that this could be really valuable for individual scenes because I feel like the overall plot is okay, but the scenes could definitely be stronger. And when it comes to the extent of scene planning I've done in the past, it's basically I have a one sentence description or maybe a vague overview of what I want to happen in a scene and when I was writing this book I would do a brief outline before I started writing most sessions and that wasn't really focused on key elements that needed to be in the scene it was more that this happens and this happens then this happens and it was a way of warming up before I started writing for the day. So what are these five commandments? Commandment one is the inciting incident so this is the event that kicks off the action in the scene. Sean says it can be a causal one, so this is something where the character makes a decision that kicks off the scene, so I think the example he gives is a wife choosing to leave her husband. Or it can be coincidental, like they won the lottery or someone picks up the wrong suitcase at baggage claim at the airport. The second element is progressive complications, and there can be multiple progressive complications. As is suggested by the terminology, these are things that make the scene more complex. So you have your inciting incident that kicks things off, and then what goes wrong, or what makes things more difficult for our characters. And this is something that's definitely lacking in my book. Commandment three is the crisis, and this is the point when the character needs to make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> so basically they're faced with options A and B for what to do next. Then commandment four is in the climax, so that is they make the decision, they take action on whatever the question was that the crisis raised, and we see them take that action. And then commandment five is the resolution, so this is the aftermath, what is the result of the climax of this scene. So what I want to do today is look at two scenes. One is a new one that I'm going to add to the book during revisions, and one is the first scene of the existing book, which I think is one of the weakest in the book. So I'm going to try outlining a scene from scratch using these five points and try reworking an existing scene in outline form using these five points and see how I go. Why do you like me? Don't you leave me alone. As you can see, I've relocated because I got a bit too warm. There was also a really persistent blowfly that would not leave me alone. So um, I'm hoping that here I'm just, I'm still on the lake, just in the park section. I'm hoping this will be a little bit calmer. <laughs> so I've looked at my scene a little bit. I 
first did the normal outline that I would do, so how I saw the scene in my head just so I had it straight because this is a new one, I haven't written it yet. Then I thought, well, what could these five points be? So the scene is basically Hannah is in the lab with her father and her experiment is proven successful. So she's been able to prove that she can trigger a superhuman power response outside of a superhuman's body. She shares her findings with her father. He praises her, but very mildly, but it happens so rarely that she's over the moon and she thinks maybe she'll be allowed on their next mission. So this scene, one, the whole discovery is actually going to be pivotal to the plot later on from the midpoint onwards. Um, I also wanted some time to explore the father-daughter dynamic because one, if you haven't seen previous videos, one of the things that kicks off the main plot is she gets kicked out of home. So we don't really get a lot of time to see this because most of the time she is away from her father who ends up being the primary antagonist of the book. So I had my brief outline, then I thought about what the points should be. For me, the discovery or the experiment being found successful, that is the inciting incident. I didn't know what the progressive complications could be, and I'm not sure if that just means that this is a scene that is too short for them, or whether I just need to do more work. It's probably I need to do more work. <laughs> then the crisis moment is, well, does she tell her father or not? You know, does she keep it to herself? Does she keep experimenting? Does she try and see whether this will help her develop her own powers? Because that's one of the problems in the book. She is in a family of supers but does not have powers herself. The decision she makes, so the climax is she decides to tell her father, she tells her father, gets the praise, and the resolution is um, at the end of the scene I want them to be alerted of a mission, so the resolution it could be that there's the potential she'll be able to go with them, which she hasn't been allowed to do because she doesn't have powers. So if we go back to the progressive complications, I'm not sure if I've struggled to think of anything because this is a really short scene, it's not that complex, um, and therefore it's not relevant, or if it's just I'm being lazy, which it's probably I'm being lazy. So I thought I'd give you an idea of how these elements work in an example that Sean shares on the Story Grid blog. A man walking down the street falls into a manhole, inciting incident. When he regains his senses, he discovers that he's waist deep in water. Complication. The water begins to rush around him and he struggles to hold his ground. Second complication. He loses his footing and he's moved along the underground current. Third complication. As he funnels through the pipe, gulping as much air as he can, he discovers that the pipe is getting narrower and it will eventually reach a circumference that he will not be able to pass through. He'll eventually plug a hole, turning point, and the water will overwhelm him and he will drown. So this is an escalation of the existing complications. He feels the surface of the pipe to try and find a handhold to halt his progress. He finds a crossbar and grabs it. The grabbing of the crossbar is an active turning point that changes the direction of the value in the scene, in this case moving him from imminent death to life. Now this is one of the things that's a little bit annoying about Sean Coyne <laughs> and the way he teaches things, is he says he's teaching one thing, in this case these five commandments, but then he introduces other stuff that hasn't been spoken about in this discussion. So here you can see He's talking about turning points. These are not in the five commandments of scenes. I'm not saying they're bad, I think they work really well in this example, but if he's giving an example to demonstrate a methodology, the example should sit wholly within that methodology, or he needs to add these turning points as an extra commandment. So he finds the crossbar, which is a turning point. However, the water keeps rushing over him, pushing him away from his hold. He understands there's a limited amount of time that he can stay in this position. As he catches his breath, his eyes adjust to the darkness. He sees there's a beam of light that shines about 20 feet away from him downstream. He suspects the beam of light comes from another manhole, like the one he fell through. So this is another turning point, a revelation. This leads to the scene's crisis. Should he let go of the crossbar and ride the water to get to that manhole? And that's on the off chance he'll be able to grab the exit ladder and make his way up to the street. Or should he stay put, wait for the rush of water to slow, and then carefully make his way to the next manhole? He remembers that it was a very busy walkway he fell through and someone undoubted, undoubtedly saw him fall into the hole. Are the chances that someone saw him and went to find help to fish him out better than him taking the risk to ride the water to the next manhole exit? So that works really well. The inciting incident, something happens, several progressive complications where the situation gets worse, um, and this brings him to the crisis point. Now, with that context, the only thing I can think of as progressive complications for the scene I'm looking at is the experiment isn't proven successful, so she fails and needs to try different things, but then that changes the inciting incident, because the inciting incident was that there was this success. Five minutes later. 
Okay, so I've tried a slightly different approach, which is inciting incident, she discovers her experiment was successful. Complication, she can't replicate with the result. So crisis, does she tell her father now? Or does she wait until she can replicate the result? Or does she wait until she can replicate the result and then potentially try using it or her discovery to develop her own powers? Then I thought if we change the order of things a little bit, I could have another complication, which is then they get notified of the mission, which suddenly creates a sense of urgency around the crisis. So if she lets him know now, then maybe he'll be impressed with her to the extent that she's allowed to go along on the mission, which she's basically never been able to do because she has no powers. So again, it's the crisis of does she tell or not given that she can't replicate the results. The problem with this is that if the climax is then she does decide to tell him, I'm worried that he's going to be too focused on the mission and um, rushing out of the house, that there won't be that moment when he praises her, which is the whole point of why I wanted this scene, because at the moment there's, like I said earlier, there's no real build up of their relationship and I want it to I want it to feel like she has some hope of pleasing him or being accepted by him so we understand why she hangs on to this idea for so long even after he kicks her out. So I'm gonna continue playing with this but I think hmm if I could get that order to work but allow enough time for a you know very good you did you know good job pig type of um type of moment in the scene then I think it could work but We'll see. Hmm. So I think I'll let that one settle for a bit and now I'm going to look at the existing scene in my book. The more I look at this, the more I'm being reminded of why I hate Story Grid. So I've looked at the new scene I want to create and I've if I reorder things I might be able to make it work with these five commandments. Then I've looked at the first scene in my book, which is a scene where an alarm bell rings in the house because it's mission time. Um, Hannah's with her sister Maria, they're getting ready, they're talking about things relating to the world. The father asks Hannah if she can get the other siblings, so we get a brief introduction to everyone and then they're off. So it's not really a scene where a lot happens and while there's an exciting incident which is the alarm going off, there aren't re progressive complications, there's no crisis decision point and so on, it's really just meet the cast. And the way Sean talks about these commandments as I said earlier, they need to be in every beat, in every scene, in every sequence of scenes, in every act. They need to be in the global structure. So that implies, well it doesn't imply, it outright says that this should be in every scene. And that means I need to completely rework this scene. So it has all of those elements. And I'm switching hands because my arm is tired. So I've also got my laptop here and I thought I'll look at some of the blog posts he does on the commandments because he gives examples in each of them. And what frustrates me is that he's cherry picked these examples to give examples that prove his point rather than showing that they are universally applicable. Which annoys me because the way he writes about them he says they're universally applicable but the examples he's chosen don't demonstrate that. So as I said earlier, he thinks these should these five commandments should apply to each part of the book, beats, scenes, groups of scenes, and so on. He talks about Silence of the Lambs in a couple of them, which is his favourite example in the Story Grid book as well. And in the Crisis Commandment, he talks about the crisis decision at three different parts of the book. So the first one is where Starling agrees to meet with Hannibal Lecter. Uh, the second one is where she confronts Crawford, her superior, about whether he'll treat him, her like an agent rather than just a trainee. And in the third one, she decides to personally go after Buffalo Bill because the FBI has the wrong man. So what he's done is talk about the crisis and climax moment in the beginning, middle and end of the book. So that's fine. But then when we get to the resolution post, all he talks about is the resolution for the book itself. Whereas if he was being consistent, he would have talked about the resolution for each part of the book. Now, because he's also talked about this applying to individual beats and scenes, what I would love is to see an example of these five points in different scenes. Because even though he says that they should appear in every scene, I don't think they do. Now I haven't actually read Silence of the Lambs, I have seen the movie several times though and one of the things he says is it follows the book very closely. So at the beginning of the movie there are sort of like montage training type of scenes, so you see Starling running in her grey sweatsuit with the other female FBI trainee. And I look at that and go, well, that is a beat or maybe a scene depending on how you define things. That doesn't have an inciting incident, progressive complication, crisis, climax or resolution. So. 
how does that work? Is that just preamble to the next scene, which does have those things? Or does that mean there are certain things that we don't need to cover them in? Because potentially my first scene is just preamble for what happens next in the book, so it doesn't need those things. So slightly frustrated at Sean Coyne again. Maybe, maybe I should just give up on the story grid. The problem is, and Nicole, if you're watching this, the problem is I keep seeing you do videos on the story grid, talking about it really eloquently, demonstrating ways in which it works. And it makes me think, maybe I missed something. Maybe I should try it again. And then I try it again and I find that I hate it just as much. So <sighs> it's good to be challenged, but I don't know how far I'm gonna continue with this. As you can see, we're now back home. It's been about four days since I last filmed and I've decided it's time to give up on this scene outlining method. And I'll move on to reasons shortly, but what I've done since we last spoke was I attempted to map out the brand new scene at the beginning of the book, the first scene of the current draft, and then I had what I hoped would be a little epiphany, which was what if rather than looking at my individual scene by scenes, because at the beginning of the book they're really little scene-lets rather than longer scenes, I thought, why don't I look at them as scene sequences? And I grouped them into three chunks, I think. So chunk one is everything before the mission. Chunk two is the mission. So the siblings have come back, Maria tells um, Hannah about the mission, and that prompts investigation because some strange things happened. So there's the mission and the question marks it raises. So I thought if I looked at the scenes in these chunks, it might be easier for me to find inciting incidents, progressive complications, crises, climaxes, and resolutions. Unfortunately, I found that wasn't the case because it was getting hard to keep track of each individual scene when I mapped them out on a separate page, I decided to use a A3 page and I did a column for each of the mini scenes that's in that section. And I tried to map each of them out using these five commandments. So the first one is Hannah and her father in the lab. Second one is like the alarm's gone off, they're preparing for the mission. The next one is she's home alone. And then the fourth scene is sort of half in this chunk of and then the fourth one is when the siblings come back from the mission. So it's sort of half in this group of scenes and half in the next one. And even looking at it this way, I really struggled. So, so a few days ago, I thought about rejigging my first scene. So maybe the alarm for the mission would come earlier and that would be an extra complication that's preventing Hannah from telling her father about her discovery. And what happened then was that the next scene got more difficult and I thought, okay, well, she goes to Maria to collect her and let her know, which doesn't really make sense because there's an alarm, so she knows. But anyway, she goes to see Maria. Inciting incident is there's an announcement following the alarm going off, which is that it's a hostage situation. Progressive complications, I thought, could be like in their conversation, which is from the existing draft, they speculate about whether it could be the Brotherhood or the Russian Mafia. New progressive complications could be that Hannah shares the results of her experiment with Maria, but Maria's not happy about it. And she, she really doesn't want Hannah to prove herself to Artem. She doesn't want her to put herself in a position where she could be in just as much danger as the other siblings. So there's this conflict as well. So first there's progressive complication with the mission, which is it might be brotherhood related. They don't know at this stage. Then there's progressive complication with the telling the father about the experiment. Maria doesn't want her to. So when we get to like the crisis moment, it's actually the same crisis moment as the last scene, assuming she hasn't told him yet. So the crisis is still, will I tell him or won't I? Or if I do end up getting her to tell him like in a rush at the end of the first scene, then in this one, the crisis would be, does she ask to go on the mission or not? Does she use this newfound clout that she thinks she has with her father to get in on the mission? So you can see I was trying to make this work. I was trying to make sure I did these five points but then what happened is, so in the original scene, if I describe it really boringly, she basically needs to fetch each of the siblings. So you get to meet everyone. There's a little bit of an introduction, not to talk too well about myself, but I, I think it's done well, like it works. You get a sense for who everyone is and what the dynamics are. So what I have in this little outline I've done is all of that stuff after the crisis. And then we've got like the second half of what's already there, which is getting her brothers, introduce Thomas and Maxime, Marlene. And none of that fits into these five commandments. The next scene was a little bit meh anyway. She was stranded at home alone. 
she was going into the lab, we were going to learn a bit more about everyone. And I think I've been able to make this more interesting because in the first scene, like in the first new scene, we have this discovery and she asks her father not to clean it up and she gets back down there and he's cleaned up all of her work and she can't find it and so there's this like mini conflict that's happening there. So even though I've really struggled to use these five commandments I don't want to say there are no benefits to having done this exercise because originally from my plotting work so with story clock story engineering and story grids obligatory scenes I knew there was going to be this brand new scene at the beginning. I knew there was going to be a new scene a little bit later with the investigation about the strange things that happened on this mission. I hadn't really thought about how the scenes in between them would change, so just going through this exercise helped me highlight that here's a way that can change. The five commandments weren't really helpful though, and that brings me to why I'm giving up, because I would love to just complain about Story Grid and everything related to it, and I'm pretty sure I'm not going to try using anything story grid related going forward because I've tried a number of times now, it doesn't work for me. But regardless of whether it's story grid or some other method, the point of all of these writing tools, the point of different story structure methods, different outlining approaches, different character sheets and questionnaires, doing the Pottermore quiz for your book characters, the point of all of these things is that they're meant to help. They're meant to make the writing process easier. They're meant to help get the creative juices flowing so you can sit down to write if you've been paralyzed about sitting down to write or if you're sitting down to write and it's not working. This is all supposed to help make it work. And what I'm finding with this exercise is that it's not helping. And that annoys me because I don't like giving up on things if I decide to do something. I want to see it through to the end. but this isn't working. I've tried a couple of different angles, I've tried it on a couple of different scenes, and I'm really struggling to find these five commandments. And it has been a number of days now. It's now the 28th of June, so Nano's coming up in just a couple of days. So I can't get stuck on this if I actually want to start revising my book on the 1st of July. Now none of this is to say that my existing scenes are perfect, or what I have in my head's perfect. I know there's a lot of room for improvement, I'm not sure what that is, but I know that these five commandments are not helping me improve it. And because they're not, it's going to be interesting to see how much I'm actually able to improve the book on a scene by scene level once I start revising, and whether I'm the type of writer who it's actually worth sending a first draft to an editor or to some beta readers to get some feedback rather than trying to push through this revision process without having any insight. But we'll see. Anyway, the moral of this story is. It's important to find the methods that work for you, and hi Nicole, I'm really glad that Story Grid works for you, keep using it, but I'm not going to. For me, I've found other things that are far more helpful, so if you're in a similar position and you're trying to force yourself to use a writing method or use a writing tool or even a routine and it's not helping, then maybe that just means it's not the right tool or routine or method for you. and. There are plenty other ones out there, so there's no reason why you can't put that one to the side as an experiment and then go look for something that is a better match. So that is all from me for today. I don't remember if I've asked any questions earlier in the video because it has been a few days, but if I haven't, I would like to hear from you about how you approach reworking individual scenes. So assuming that your overall plot is solid, your characters are solid, your themes and all of the foundational parts of your book are solid. How do you give each individual scene the inf it needs to really grip your readers and make them want to keep reading? So please let me know in the comments below. Other than that, please like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I will see you next time. Bye.